Welcome to Sanibel and Captiva's original podcast, The Insider's Guide to the Islands. My name is Nick Adams from Nick Adams Photography. I will be chatting with island experts from fishing guides to shellers to local personalities. I aim to get the insider information to make your island experience incredible. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Bruce Neal, or Doc Bruce, as he's known, the co-founder and executive director from the Sanibel Sea School. Welcome. Thank Very you. Very nice to meet you, Bruce. Very We've nice to be here. Before, but I've heard a yeah. lot about you, and I've definitely seen you all over the island. And uh, well, I hope some of it's been good. Uh, absolutely. We go across the causeway every day, and we're always uh, seeing the programs out there. Yep. So tell me a little bit about your history and how you ended up coming to Sanibel. Uh, I'm a native Floridian. I grew up in Miami on the east coast of Florida, um, and my family moved away to the southern part of Georgia, just on the other side of the Florida line, uh, when I was 11 or 12 years old. And uh, then I sort of spent a vast majority of my time moving around. I went to college in Georgia, uh, decided to major in the study of animals, zoology, went to the University of Guam and got a master's degree in, in coral reef conservation and then uh, got a graduate degree in conservation biology, a, a PhD in conservation biology, and started out as a college teacher. And uh, I'm married to a wonderful lady, Evelyn Neal, and we were living in Portland, Oregon. We followed her career to New York, to Manhattan, and we needed to get out of Manhattan and said, where can we go? And we kind of looked at flights and Sanibel, and we had both come to Sanibel as kids. And so we said, okay, well, in three hours, we can be in Sanibel from JFK. Let's go there. And many years ago, when we were living in Portland, we dreamt up this idea of having a field school to teach kids about the ocean only in the ocean. So totally immersive school. We sort of designed that school to originate in Hawaii. We went out and shopped and found a piece of real estate in Hawaii, bought a piece of real estate with partners, and that particular piece of real estate in the South Kona district of the island of Hawaii didn't work out. And we were having kids. I was an assistant professor at a little college there. She was in the advertising world, and we decided, you know what, this that was fun, but forget it. And we fast forward a couple of years, we go to New York, we come to Sanibel. Uh, on a vacation and we said oh my god what a great place for that school we thought about and we're very habitual creatures so we would literally come back down two or three or four times a year on every long weekend or whatever we had and every time we would say oh we should do that school well you go back home and you get busy and, and mm -hmm. things go by the wayside and then 9-11 uh, happened. And if you were living in New York uh, when 9-11 happened, it was sort of a game changer. You realize the world's not going to end up like you thought it was going to end up. And I will credit Evelyn or throw her under the bus um, <laughs> she, since she's not here to defend yeah. herself. Um, she said, you know what, we're, we're going to turn around and be 70 years old. And the big regret we're going to have is not doing this school that we've dreamt about now for 10 years. And so we just decided, you know, let's go for it. Let's do it. Um, and sold our house in New York, bought a house here and leased the little building uh, that we're in now today, 14 years later or whatever, um, and moved down and started Santa Bell Sea School. So you're in that same building you are now, the one that's on the east end of the island, is that, or, or a different one? Uh, well, we occupy two buildings. Okay. Uh, one is on Periwinkle Way, uh, and that's our second most recent acquisition. The original one is immediately behind it, but you access it through Lagoon Drive. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So it wasn't actually on uh, uh, Periwinkle Way. It, it wasn't was on Periwinkle, it's on Lagoon. And gotcha. it's a fantastic little historical building that, uh, at least the story goes, and it's a great story, so we're going to yeah, go with it. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that it was one of the buildings that was built in World War II to house the Army Signal Corps station at the lighthouse to look for German U-boats. Oh, cool. Those buildings, after the war, got decommissioned and moved to become what is now the colony. And then the colony, when it updated its uh, apartments and condos, sold them around, and some of them got moved again. And so the building that we're in 
has been on Sanibel since 42 or something wow. like that. And, and the colony is literally right behind your building, but back further towards the Gulf of Mexico. Exactly. It's yeah. out on the beach out there. Yeah. Wow. And uh, is it, can you tell it's an older building? I mean, I haven't actually seen, I thought you were, so you, you would, if, as you're facing your new building now, you would go down to the left of it or to you the would, right of it? You would go to the left of it. You'd okay. go to the east of it. And there is a street that borders our, new, our big building on Periwinkle. And that building is really an administrative building for the most part the one on Periwinkle yeah. all of the the sort of magic the good stuff happens in Lagoon Drive building okay, okay. and yes it's uh, all made with Dade County Pine it's a total wooden building on the inside it's beautiful gorgeous floors and paneling and ceiling um, and so it literally is a, a building built from pine trees that were harvested in Dade County which is now Miami right. so they're gone right. um, historic and just a beautiful warm rich building fascinating that's yeah, wow. fantastic that's incredible so um what is the tell me tell me what you're saying about uh, we are the ocean tribe what does that mean to you what's the where does that come from and what's the- uh you know i i think increasingly um well number one we, there are a group of people particularly the the kids at sanibel sea school and the adults uh feel very tribal they they our most successful week of summer camp for the last dozen years is always Calusa week. Okay. It's not dolphin week. It's not sea turtle week. It's not shark week. It's, it's not all of these things. It's Calusa week. Um, and I, I think that this band of kids really enjoys becoming tribal and, and feeling like they belong to somewhere. That's one of the really interesting things about sort of the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. We're connected to everyone all over the world. Yeah. And we're creating tiny little tribes. We're not becoming more connected. We're becoming more connected to a selected group of people. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that we sort of advocate for these kids is absolutely find that tribe of people that you're comfortable with. And, and what we share in common in that tribalism is sort of a passion for and a love of the ocean. So that's going back for the, if you if you haven't been to Sanibel yet if you're on your way down here or um, it's full circle basically because the Calusa were a, a, a tribe um, uh, indigenous people from many centuries ago and they found right. uh, shell mounds and um, the earliest known inhabitants of this yep. particular area. Am I correct? Absolutely, and there's pretty good evidence. Uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, the Calusa were very non-terrestrial. They built shell mounds out in San Carlos Bay and in the water. They literally lived on top of the water. They didn't mm -hmm. spend a whole lot of time on land. They didn't do any agriculture. They didn't have a written language, so we don't know much about them. They persisted and, and flourished for 2,500 years here. Um, and uh, in the 1500s, we helped them become extinct. We brought diseases uh, to them, and one of the things that, that we like to conveniently forget is that European explorers were slavers, so they captured Indians to go back to a servant in servitude to Europe. One of the things that the Spaniards did was, uh, apart from actively collecting slaves from the Calusa tribe, they also armed the enemies of the Calusa, the Creek tribe, and got the creek to enslave the Calusa to sell to really? Spaniards. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. So, and, you know, I think one of the things that we also forget to recognize very widely is, is Ponce de Leon discovered Florida. Mm -hmm. However, Came when into you... St. Augustine and the... Uh, well, but, and he spent a lot of time in San Carlos mm -hmm. Bay. Um, yeah. And uh, there's something that, that's kind of strange. You discover Florida only to discover there's 10,000 people there. Right. <laughs> well, do, you, do you really get to discover Florida if 10,000 people are already there? Um, but uh, there was a, a large skirmish, uh, and Ponce de Leon was mortally wounded at the place where you pay the toll to cross the causeway to come to Sanibel Island. He was shot in the leg with either an arrow or a spear, and he hightailed it to the only Spanish port, Havana, mm -hmm. and died six days later of his, his wounds. So, so in reality, he was mortally wounded in San Carlos Bay, and I think we tend to forget the history. Yeah. And we forget the history predates that by another 2,000 years. So right. People were here, and, and the interesting thing happened after Irma, a, a boat was washed up on the east coast of Florida, that was an outrigger canoe. 
I have a friend who's an outrigger canoe paddle designer in Oregon. I sent him this video and he looked at it. He goes, oh, Hawaiian racing canoe. Mm -hmm. And the really interesting thing is we tend to think these Native American sort of aboriginal tribes were just barely getting by. But if you're making a canoe for racing, you got a lot of spare time. That's right. Right. Yeah. So it, it's it. They they flourished. They Incredible. Really, so um, really um, well. it was the last uh, hurricane here in uh, September. September. Yeah. yeah. So so wow, they were doing. Incredible. They weren't just barely scraping by. They had a wonderful civilization here, and and unfortunately that history is gone. So we want these these people we want all of us but particularly these young kids to recognize i do have a tribe i do have a a Mm -hmm. society it may not be necessarily my school but it's this group of people that we have a passion for the ocean yeah that's fantastic and and, i mean you could go off in so many different tangents but even just what you were saying about punta rasa and and that area there with, with the big links or it was a, 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 it's really a nondescript part now. Of it's just the base of the um, where the boat ramp is, where That's the right. where the bridge goes over to Sanibel. But it's got a huge amount of history. Really does. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, you could literally do a whole. Well, there's, there's been books written about it. Just the whole right. cattle trade going to Cuba and exactly. and uh, the first uh, telephone lines going under the water to Cuba right. and all the trade and then going back to what you were saying. So yeah, that's incredible. Right. I mean, how think these things interweave and become one subject is is incredible hey i was looking at your um website and i was looking i was amazed by the different staff members that you have and their right. backgrounds and i mean it, tell us a little bit about i mean it's just reading their bios and just like yep. just wow these guys. yeah we've been really really lucky we uh we we sort of put our bar at at what we want our employees to do is to be passionate about kids primarily and passionate about the ocean and and we've gotten really lucky there's this group of people that have very diverse backgrounds they come together uh and and they they have these two driving passions they love kids and they love the ocean and so um it's really interesting sanibel sea school is an institution in that it's a group of people that want to achieve a similar goal. And one of our goals is to facilitate everyone who works there getting better at what they're doing. So we're really focused on self-growth. Uh, and I think in many places, uh, businesses, and Sanibel Sea School is a business, it's a not-for-profit business, but it's a business, we tend to focus too much on the product that we make we mm-hmm. make an educational experience um rather than focusing on the people that we have and so if we can really spend a lot of time nurturing that group of a dozen people yeah. and and letting them feel like they are are reaching their highest potentials then they're going to pass that on to kids and w- one of our very simple goals is we want kids to fall in love with the ocean we recognized a long time ago we can't ask kids to fall in love with the ocean without first loving them right so we love kids we we enjoy kids we play with kids we they sit in our laps we throw them around the ocean and and kids are really really hungry for intimate not inappropriate but just intimate relationships with adults Mm -hmm. we have in our society for tons of great reasons made the educational system very sterile Mm -hmm. and and for very good reason however kids love the fact that we love them that we want to talk to them we want to hear what they have to say to to communicate with them and for us that's the the foothold through which we get into them Mm -hmm. So if we talk to them, once they really love the people that are teaching them, then we can kind of teach them whatever we want to teach them. It's incredible you say that. And I think um, just by looking, there was uh, a couple of people that had been involved in the sea school as kids and then come back, gone away, done some different things and have now come back again. Exactly. Full circle. I mean, that's a testament to you guys and what a great job you've done there. And I know my brother-in-law, who's uh, now a doctor, but during his time off in the summer, used to do exactly that. He would go volunteer to go to different places diving oh, cool. and, and, and counting species and things like that. And just uh, he spent his entire summers doing it, which blossomed into a, a lifelong passion for diving. Oh, nice. You know, where he's going three or four times a year, him and his wife, 
Um, so exactly that sort of thing. It's inspiring yep. people to go on and fall in love with the ocean. Laurie and I are both avid divers and boaters, nice. so we, yep. we love the water too. So I can totally, I can totally dig it. But the 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 ocean around this area is slightly different, and I think if you didn't, obviously you know it intimately. Um, it, it goes from cloudy, it goes from beautiful blue, it goes from, but it's not your typical Bahamas water. Um, what would you say about the oceans around here um, and the sea schools? What are people most surprised about, the, the, the types of uh, uh, the things that you find here that people wouldn't necessarily know about? We all know about the dolphins and you know, right. sharks and things yeah. like that. And, uh, but t- tell us some other things. That- you know, I, I think one of the things that, that people are, are surprised about is how little we know about the oceans. So if you were really truly going to ask a, a biologist to sort of catalog what happens in the waters around Sanibel, the the answer of we don't know would appear much more than we do know. So there's tons of discoveries out there to be made. Um, That's amazing in this day is, and age. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And literally, we truly know more about the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean. And so it's really powerful to kids to tell them, no, you can discover something new and it's right here and you need a net and that's it. <laughs> right, so, yeah. uh, and one of the things that, that we, some of our staff love um, new to brank sea slugs. Mm-hmm. Um, there are big giant ones in various Pacific reefs that are called Spanish dancers that, that go up high, but we have a lot of really great sea slugs here. Mm-hmm. One of our, our staff's most favorite animals is an animal uh, called the sea hare, and it's H-A-R-E, and it looks a lot like a rabbit. It's a big, giant purple thing that crawls around your hands and Mm -hmm. produces purple ink. Um, And so I I think the thing that that really kids key in on, and adults to some degree, are the things that are literally under your nose that you never noticed. Right, right, right. right. Because we do. We see all these dolphins, and we see all these big things, but then if you slow down, stop, and turn over a rock, and take a few minutes and see what crawls out from under the rock it's just so amazing. that's that takes me back to uh we my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law again um exact same thing they go diving all over the world to places we can only dream about going i know you've been to some of them um but they we had a cartoon drawn for them and it was my brother-in-law looking and there was a great big whale shark you know dreading you know huge great big thing yep. and then behind him he's tapping his tank trying to get Amy's attention, uh, Laurie's sister's attention, and she's down there finding these minuscule, yes. microscopic things that are way rarer, way more hard to find. Right. And she it doesn't matter where she goes, she seems to find these things that are six inches and yep. and smaller that are just absolutely amazing. You know, so yeah, and I think that's kind of a common thing for people that have been in the ocean for a long time because we do that very consistently. We're almost always leading kids when we're in the ocean, and we never scuba dive at Sanibel Sea School. Even with uh, older kids, we take up to 20-year-olds to Belize, fantastic places to dive, but we want them to free dive. We, we oh, don't really? want okay. them to scuba dive. But it is funny because these kids will be like, oh, my word, did you see that giant shark? It's like, no, we miss that. Because we're, <laughs> we're looking at these little tiny things. And, uh, oh, that's but, funny. And we don't, uh, we want them to free dive because when you scuba dive, you introduce technology mm-hmm. and there's all this this gadgetry and this heavy weight on your back and you've got to think about numbers and and pounds of air and and stops and all that and, and we want kids to experience the ocean in a visceral way mm-hmm. and there there is a beauty to free diving for sure um and Last summer, I watched some of our, what are now 18-year-old kids who have been in our program since they were five, free diving to 70 feet. Wow. So they're Impressive. accomplished ocean people, right? Wow. They're, they're, wow. they're good and they're comfortable in the water. And those same people are scuba certified. And as 17 or 18-year-old kids, they were like, can we scuba dive? It's like, no, you can't. As it turns out, go do this. Um, <laughs> scuba dive on your own time. Yeah. Uh, which is fantastic. There's nothing at all wrong with scuba diving. And it really does allow you to sit in this one spot and look for all these tiny right. little things. But it, it's just an entirely different way that you engage with the ocean. And I think that's, uh, that for me personally, I, th- I think the first time I ever got totally hooked on the ocean was as a, I was fortunate enough as my father was traveled a lot um, with uh, British Airways and we went to a vacation and uh, Bermuda was swimming off a dock and I was mm. frightened of everything absolutely right. scared to death of everything as I was snorkeling along 
a beautiful stingray swam underneath me. Right. And I, there was that, that moment that I realized that everything wasn't there trying to, I was only probably 10 years old, right. that everything wasn't trying to eat me and I was just <laughs> actually yep. part of the water. And I think that for me sparked a lifelong appreciation for the, for the sea and the ocean and what's in it. And Well, that's exactly one of the things that we spend an enormous amount of time doing. And, you know, I, I will credit in a negative way the movie Jaws that, that helped us uh, sort of amalgamate our fear of the ocean. We're, we're not ocean creatures, but um, every kid who goes to the ocean is either more or at least slightly scared of it, mm-hmm. right? They're great if they can wait up to here. Yeah. But if you ask them to, to dive into it, particularly in our waters, they're like, no, we can't do that. And, you know, so we, we sit and spend time and we... We take kids night snorkeling here during you do? the summertime. Oh yeah, every year. Wow. <laughs> uh, we start with five year olds night snorkeling. Really? Um that and sounds we're in interesting. seagrass beds this deep and we we see great stuff at night. And it, it's not so much about what we see, it's about the experience. Mm-hmm. And to recognize that the ocean at night is exactly the same ocean it was a few hours ago with less light. And it looks completely right? different. But yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. completely different, but yeah. it really is the same. Yeah. Um, and the in the United States, you have roughly 400 times more, you are 400 times more likely to die from a toaster than a shark. Really? Really. Uh, <laughs> so we talked to this about kids, like when you're in your kitchen, are you scared of your toaster? They're like, no. It's like, well, why are you scared of a shark? Because it's not going to happen. Um and there are a lot of sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. There's no denying it. And I work Tons. on the beach every night and I see them regularly. Um, yep. I fly as well. I'm, uh, a, I'm a paramotor pilot and we see them from the air. Yep. Um, so I don't. I think it's no secret and definitely don't be alarmed because it, for the amount of sharks that are out there, there is, I don't even remember the last time there was an incident. So No, and there, you know, there are certain places and times of days and things that uh you can avoid and and one of them is to not carry bait in your pockets if you're going to fish yeah and i gotta tell you as a kid i i did that i I didn't want to go back to shore to get more bait i'll stick in my pocket uh the vast majority of all shark encounters in florida that uh, are dealing with fishermen and either they're carrying wounded fish on a string next to them or they're carrying bait and in murky water um, the other components that, that if you seriously want to avoid a, a shark encounter are uh, during twilight either dusk, early yeah. morning dusk oh, or dawn, dawn. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and deep drop offs ledges drop-offs. where it's going from shallow to deep um, and the mouth of the river too but i, I live on the calusa hatchie uh, yep. is that is that well isn't that a breeding ground during the sure but, but it's not it's any more dangerous than anywhere else exactly or, no uh, i don't think it's any more dangerous and I, I think the other part that people don't recognize right away is that most of the time we have this this notion that predators are fearless big giant tough tyrannosaurus rex or sharks or right. whatever but recognize when one animal is going to catch another animal, there's there's going to be near death combat or death combat. And combat means two of them are fighting. So a predator is almost always going to assess what the likelihood is that it's going to be me, the aggressor that dies in this encounter or gets injured. Right. Hence the idea that predators usually take the old, the right. sick or the very young because yep. they're easy targets. Right. Um, and I'm a very large fish. Yes. If you put me into the ocean, I fish a lot, but I've not very frequently ever caught a 180 pound fish. <laughs> and so when you put me into the ocean and I have a shark coming up to me, yeah. it's going to go, yeah, I'm not that hungry. Let's pick something I'm easier. Gonna, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to go find something old and weak or whatever. Um, yeah. So makes total sense. Yeah, the likelihood that we're going to be seriously bitten by a shark, if at all, is very, very low. Yeah, yeah, uh, understood. And that's good for people to know, I think, for sure. You've got um, several locations on the island, haven't you? We do. We, uh, we have several relationships with various resorts around the island, but we also have two locations on Sanibel. Uh, we have a campus that's embedded in the Sundial Resort, and then we have what we think of as our flagship campus on the east end of Sanibel. 
We also do uh, programming with South Seas Island Resort on the north end of Captiva. Um, we also do programming with several other resorts on Sanibel, but we don't have physical locations there. Gotcha. We so you'll go them to up. them and do a program we go to as them. and when needed. Exactly. Well, on a pretty regular basis oh, okay. so that for their guests, um, they will know that there will be a, a beach walk or a shell walk or a bird walk or children's classes or something that's for their an absolute, sorry I don't mean to interrupt you but I'm that's sorry. an absolutely amazing segue I want to say before I, I didn't I was I didn't know I knew obviously you were a C school but I didn't mm-hmm. understand the depth and breadth of all the different courses that you do you, right. you've got stuff for adults so you would tell we us do. a little bit about all the different programs that you offer we do uh we offer regular sort of courses and for us a course lasts for three hours it's either a morning or an afternoon and a kid can come and have both a morning and an afternoon together and eat lunch with us uh we do that year round during the summertime we offer week-long non-residential camps so kids come to us for five consecutive days but go home at night and spend gotcha. the night um and those are really cool we have kids from all over the united states and uh, a lot of europe um during the summertime there are are weeks on the east end of the island where there's seven languages going on in Santa Bell Sea School. It's just You're crazy. Kidding. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And there are French kids practicing their English and English kids practicing their French and Spanish <laughs> kids and kids from the Czech Republic and Czechs uh, from uh, Poland. And, do you have and any bilingual over. staff? Or? Uh, we have several bilingual Spanish English okay. and we have one that's French English, um, but nothing more you know but you get by you we f- do. You, yeah you we figure totally it out. get by yeah. um so uh we do that during the summertime we also uh offer programs for adults in the fall and in the spring and it's essentially not very different than what we do with kids but we spend a little less time in the field and more time sort of in a classroom situation with them we uh also are developing more and more paddle sports. We spend a lot of time on stand-up paddle boards. Uh, This is more for teenagers and Mm -hmm. younger or or adults. And a paddle board is a fantastic way to engage with the ocean in this part of the world. Kayaks are, are, are good. And I think they're traditional craft, but when you stand up on a paddle board, some people who are uh, more seasoned um, feel like they can't do that. But if they get on the right paddle board, it's pretty stable. And the difference is that you can actually see down into the water. You can see the bottom. You can see the bottom and you can see a long way on the horizon. When you're in a kayak, you're just kind of bobbing above the surface. Yeah, I guess I've never thought of it that way, but it's very true. Yeah, Yeah, no, it's a totally great way to do it. So we uh, offer those sorts of programming on a continual basis and also in summertime. Uh, We have some camps that are specifically designed to be on paddle boards. We uh, canoe in summertime down the Caloosahatchee River and spend three or four days and canoe 30 or 40 miles down the Caloosahatchee oh, wow. River, which is fantastic. Wow. We take a group of teenagers and start inland and canoe back to Sanibel camping along the way. And it's a really interesting thing because most of the kids in this part of the world come to Sanibel and they have no appreciation for what it looks like 20 miles inland. And the Caloosahatchee River, although it is challenged and brings a fair amount of nutrient-laden water, is a beautiful river. Mm-hmm, for and sure. you go in there, and, and, and it's an entirely different world. And so it's a really interesting sort of rite of passage for kids to be able to go 40 miles in a canoe and, and be self-contained. That. Um, is that part of the Blue Way? Or? Uh, we're on part of the Blue Way during it. The Blue Way is 180 miles, so it's mm. a giant trail, but parts of what we're paddling on are the Blue Way, but we really just come down the main course of the Caloosahatchee and go through a lock, which is crazy in a canoe, a Franklin Lock, we go through it and then come on down. And, oh, and, you were that far up? So that's up by... Uh, 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 we're uh, up by down. Alva. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah so wow. it's well, a long that's way a long, up. So you're going past downtown and you're... Oh, yeah, I go yeah. down through... Uh, Cape out Coral. by the Civic Center. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of at the end. We're almost there when we get to the Civic Center. So how Center. long is that trip? Uh, it's a four days. Four three days. days. Wow. Yeah. yeah so, so we find places some... to camp alongside. We carry it all. So it's literally a band of canoes going down. So there's no support. Um, and we carry everything we're going to eat. And Sounds like fun. Fantastic. Though, it? It's a lot of fun. It's <laughs> really <laughs> great. So we uh, do that for teenagers. Um, one of the things that, that we do recognize is that most of the people who have paid six dollars to cross 
the causeway are very affluent people globally they're giantly affluent people but even by sort of american standards they're pretty affluent people and there's a little bit of strategy to that we want young people who have a great likelihood to be important decision makers in the future to love the ocean so that when they're senators and judges and accountants and attorneys that and they see something about the ocean they sit up and they take notice they go wait a minute the ocean that belongs to me I, that, i'm the ocean tribe and we should work to conserve it however we recognize the importance of the people that live on the other side of the bridge that don't get to come here very often if at all and it would amaze most of the people to recognize how many people live within a dozen miles of the bridge at Punta Rasa who never come to the ocean that's, so uh, yeah it's incredible and it is that, and yeah, we yeah have for a sure. giant land we call them landlocked kids mm -hmm. and we have an arrangement with about 10 different institutions <clears throat> excuse me in both Hendry and Lee counties to bring those kids to the ocean to teach them and about there's the no ocean. excuse I think what's the furthest uh, position from <clears throat> the ocean is 60 miles in Florida is that right oh probably so yeah, yeah. 60 and miles from you can't be further than 60 miles from the ocean yeah so isn't that crazy yeah so and we we kind of go to that 60 miles we take kids from Hendry County um, we've brought kids from Immokalee and it's pretty amazing to watch a kid who's never seen the ocean they grew up in Florida and, and, and how explain how is that funded? Is that is that a charitable thing, or is it is it part of the schools district? No, or? it's totally funded by philanthropy. Oh, we, really? Yeah, uh, and I'm kind of proud of Santa Bell Sea School. We have yet to ever turn down anyone based on financial need. We have a hundred percent scholarship program that is based on. Um, uh, honesty if someone calls and they say i'd like my kid to engage in santa Bell sea school but i can't afford it we say okay there's no paperwork to fill out there's no form all you have to That's do is awesome. ask um and uh we are very lucky in that we have a a group of of great supporters who fund that who help fund that and uh, so all of that, we have a couple of grants from local institutions, a local church funds part of that work, um, several other granting agencies fund that, but most of it is done by our single fundraiser that happens in the spring out on the Causeway we Islands. That on yeah, the we put that giant island there. tent. That's yeah. right. Um, and so we solicit donations for that scholarship fund. Um, after Irma, we recognized that there was this giant need for uh, essentially daycare. All of the schools in Lee County were closed for two weeks following Irma. Almost all of the businesses got going one week after Irma. So schools were closed, but work was happening people needed a place to take their kids mm -hmm. and we had we suffered a little bit of damage in Irma from the physical plant but we recognized there was this need to do something we said well, why don't we have a camp why don't we have hurricane camp camp hurricane so we we sat down threw together the plans for this camp and began to solicit people who wanted to bring their kids to camp we register our kid all of our participants through the internet we didn't have good internet service and everybody didn't have good internet service and people were having a hard time enrolling. We had some number of people and then we were swamped with questions about scholarships. Well, we always have a scholarship program. All you have to do is ask, always. Okay. 365 days a year. If you wanna to come to Sanibel Sea School and you feel like you can't afford it, that's awesome. you pay what you can afford. And if you can afford nothing, that's fine too. So, but what we realized is after Irma, all of this was crazy. We said, you know what, forget it. Let's just have free camp. Everybody's free. You just come free, drop off your kids. And we had 85 kids, a record number of kids wow. for a week. And, and it was fantastic. These kids were coming from houses that didn't have electricity. They, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have running water. And the most important thing is, is they got to go to camp for a week. They got to be kids. We just yeah, went out and played awesome. in the ocean and, and we did stuff. And, and we realized, wow, there are all of these holidays during the year, teacher work days and all of these little holidays where schools are closed, but businesses aren't closed. 
So what are the parents doing for their kids during those holidays? Well, they're scrambling around trying to find some place to do it. So we created a, a, a different program that's called Community Camp. And yeah. it's free of charge. And on any, they're scheduled, on, but on pretty much any school holiday that's not a national holiday, our doors are open and free. You just come in and bring your kids and we, we have a, a community camp. Uh, we are a not-for-profit foundation. The IRS um, categorizes us, we're a 501c3, as a public charity. And so in reality, nobody owns Sanibel Sea School. Our job is to serve the public. And when we see a need, we go and do it. And typically, that's kind of the, the not so smart business strategy. Right. <laughs> um, because typically people go, oh, we see a need now, let's write a grant and let's go do it. But we're dealing with little kids. So if we have to put off filling that need for three years, waiting for the funding, we lost that kid. Right. Because now they're nine and it's gone past them. It's gone. So we just dive in and start doing it and then look around the community and go, <laughs> somebody help fund this thing. <laughs> you know, we're doing the same. And, and we're really, really lucky. We live in a community that, that steps up every time. That's yeah, amazing. That's fantastic. Thing. And then, uh, so you're partnering with Child Care of Southwest Florida as we well. We are. That's our most recent uh, addition to our landlocked program. Child Care of Southwest Florida uh, is a consortium of about six different facilities. I believe. Uh, we also have partnerships with the Pace Center for Girls, the Heights Foundation, Glad Learning and Development Center, um, the and several others in Fort Myers. And either we go out on Saturdays and pick these kids up on a bus and bring them out, or uh, depending on the institution, sometimes our teachers go to them and bring them stuff in jars and, and stuff like that and schlep it into their classroom. Well, hats off to you guys because it sounds like it sounds like uh, you're making an active effort to get out to the community, not just saying, you know. No, we you, really you're are. You're really actually we, trying to go out and bring people absolutely. back in and that's that's uh, to be commended that's awesome yep. no yeah. we absolutely spend a lot of time to to engage these young kids and you know the even though i i said this statistically true statement those more affluent kids are more likely to be effective decision makers statistically that's true mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that those kids who are are less able to get to the ocean don't have potential we can't uh, write them off no right? that's and, right and maybe you've sparked an interest in somebody that would never have had an interest absolutely in front of them yeah, yeah. No, no that's an amazing totally thing. cool I think with that's those great. kids we love those uh, and kids. do you have um as you are a charity do you have volunteer positions or no uh, we do. We have some volunteers that mostly help with administrative components of it, and so we welcome volunteers. Um, it's a harder thing to have volunteers to engage with kids because mm -hmm. we have federal background screening and all of the precautionary components that are a little more difficult. And uh, quite honestly, the work that we do with kids in the ocean in Southwest Florida is hard work. We sweat a lot. <laughs> we carry a lot of kids. We It's a physically demanding hard work. And in this part of the world, we're, we're blessed with tons of volunteers, but they're usually not in physical shape to be able to gotcha. schlep a 40-year-old, 40-pound kid around, you know, who's got a sore foot or whatever. For sure. So the, the ability and... And they come to us for that. They don't come to us to get read to in a circle. Right, right, right. We're, right, right, we're right. out in the field and going. So they want to actually do They want to get in and do. So it really is a challenge to have uh, volunteerism in our classroom, the ocean. Although we do have some who do it. Uh, yeah. And we, we also, uh, one of the other sort of avenues of things that we do is we monitor the sand dollar populations on Sanibel. We have these fantastic creatures out there, sand dollars, that mm -hmm. science knows nothing about. Um, so we spend time every month going out, monitoring, measuring sand dollars, seeing how many are there to get an understanding of their long-term population dynamics. With that understanding, we'll be better able to answer what the effects of water quality challenges are. And we have a number of volunteers from the community who help us with that research, who go out and, and oddly enough, 
we scuba dive in four feet of water, um, 25 <laughs> meters from the shore so that we can really get down there in the sand. Yeah. And, and uh, it, it's really unpleasant scuba diving. Yeah, um, you can't see your hand in front can't, of your face. No, you can't see your hand in front of your face, and you have to wear 27 pounds of weight to make you sit on the bottom. <laughs> or somebody's just standing there with their foot on your, your back. Your just toes, all trying you in, to keep you down. Mashing yeah. you into the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if there could be a, 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 an island um, icon, uh, it would probably be, or if there was a national seashell that was dedicated just to Sanibel, it would probably be the sand dollar. Although there's no such thing. Yes, but exactly. In, in every single logo, every single brochure, right. there's a sand dollar. Um, right. Uh, it's uh, very popular. And oh. we literally know very little about their population. Really? I didn't know that. No, uh, know very little about that. We, we really don't have a good concept of what makes for a good year for sand dollars or a bad year for sand dollars. We have literally, Sanibel Sea School has discovered when they breed how often they breed, um, uh, what their growth rates are, what their population death rates seem to be. Sometimes, you know, we have big storms and things, and, and none of that was known to science when we started. And so one of the things that we do with these sand dollars is we encourage high school age kids and middle school age kids to have science fair projects and they can take a small little research project that they can answer themselves and then we can sort of fit all of that together into a larger meta picture of what the sand dollars look that's like that's fantastic um, that's science at grassroots isn't it exactly I mean, truly know, that's, and, that's incredible stuff and one of the things that that is embarrassing and it links back to what i said earlier when something like the bp oil spill comes along the deep water horizon oil spill from years ago people always say oh my word what's going to what's going to happen and biologists are left with the the embarrassing concept to say, well, gee, we really don't know because we don't know how many animals are out there now. We we can't imagine it's going to be good, yeah. but but we really can't tell you. Um, so, for example, we love Junonia. We just yeah, right? I just read about that. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So but we don't know anything you. about the biology right. of Junonia. So uh, didn't we, they just dredge a Junonia up? They off did. Of, yeah, they off did. Of, uh, and they're trying to understand the biology, but it's really the first time that we've ever done that. And yeah. so if somebody asks us uh, let's take it away from the Genoni and go to something like a, a lettered olive some fantastic little shell we find a fair amount of if somebody said oh gee all you scientists how's the lettered olive population on Sanibel mm -hmm. we have no idea none whatsoever. unless let's just put it a perspective on a on a layman's uh, point of view I the Genonia has been the shell to find and right. if there's a list of shells the Genonia is the one that you you know, if you find it's the holy grail of shells. Right. And uh, there was the perception that they were coming from miles and miles away and just trundling under the seabed and then washing up on the shore. And then that recently they just, some scientists were dredging to check on populations and they actually found some live Genonia shells. That's 20 right. 20 miles offshore, was yeah, it? Yeah, not very far offshore. They're relatively deep water. Um, and we've just never in the history of humanity in this part of the world and we have a significant amount of it we've been here since the late 1800s we've never thought to monitor what are the we see the shells on the beach mm -hmm. but we've never thought okay well how many how are these shells doing out in the ocean and we really don't have any idea for the most part unless we eat them we don't know anything about them under the water. <laughs> There's a financial reason to look <laughs> yes, out Yes, exactly. For so we just That's don't know incredible. about that stuff. And, and it's a great role that an institution like Sanibel Sea School can fill in a void in science. It costs money to, to understand living things. And feet on the ground, which yeah, you have. Well, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's giving you that. Yeah, and yeah. so we have that. And, and it also feeds our, our, most of our staff are relatively young. They're young scientists. Um, and it there's a, an absolute wonder and joy to engaging with eight-year-olds in the ocean. But at some point, it's nice to become sort of more scientific mm -hmm. and go out and, okay, one day a month we get to go out and, and use that other side of our brain. And, and see collectible and data that is actually quantifiable. I exactly. Mean, you, you, the, the work you're doing with the sand dollar. I mean, and we've see. just, uh, I don't know what its status of, but we've just submitted one of the scientific papers that were written off the data um, that we collected wow. through Santa Bell That's C School. fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. We uh, have had a fantastic partnership with an embryologist, um, and we take teenagers to the Florida Keys, 
And during uh, that part of what we do in the Florida Keys is we go out to a national marine sanctuary and look at coral reefs. But we also do labs in a campground where we're camping. And we take a solar inverter and a microscope and we do embryology labs. And so we take sperm and eggs from sea urchins or sand dollars and fuse them together and we watch the fertilization of an egg and then we watch that egg divide and become uh, almost a metamorphic sea star or whatever the animal was and most of our counselors who are college students have never seen that and watched that no, happen I'm sure. yeah. and so these are 11 year old kids doing embryology that's sort of collegiate level embryology and they totally get it. They understand it. It's, it's it, most marine biology an eight year old can understand. It's about giving them a little bite and yeah. then go do something fun. Let's go play around and do right. something. Then another little bite and go do something fun. And so they really have great ability for comprehension of most of marine biology. And it's going back to what you said about an intimate interaction with adults where you're That's getting right. a little bit deeper than just throwing seashells across the beach you're That's actually right. adding in a little bit of education and and saying yep. oh this can actually be cool and fascinating rather than right. just you know something that we've got to do you being know? beaten by a pencil and a book exactly right. yeah no, yeah, no totally that's fantastic is. that's yeah. fantastic and um so the last lastly just what you you it's not just kids you've got some uh, programs do you not do some walking programs or is there bird we, spotting that you do? Or? Uh, we do. We uh, I don't know exactly the schedule. It's all online. But we uh, any adult can come in a couple of times a week. We have regularly scheduled uh, walks on the beach where we go and explore shells. And, and they're called shell walks. And we're going out there to look at shells. But then we're really using shells as the excuse to go to the beach and see what we can discover. Mm -hmm. So on a shell walk, we'll talk about all kinds of different things. The other thing that we do on a very routine basis with adults is go on bird walks. Almost all of us are, are somehow tantalized by the birds on the shore. Uh, they're very difficult to uh, identify until you have practiced a little bit. So we take a lot of adults on bird walks and shell walks. But if you wanted to learn about this part of the world and you want to learn about the history and the biology you would do it on a bird walk or a shell walk right. yes you'll learn about birds and shells yeah. but there's so much more out there um and you know it's not as though if we're on a bird walk and we see dolphins foraging on the beach we go no 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 no, don't look that way that's, that's <laughs> not a bird forget that bird it's all um, part of being out there yeah exactly it, yeah. it's really just about taking a little walk out there and seeing what we can discover uh, and we hear this all the time uh, don't you get tired of going to the ocean because you go day after day after day and the really fascinating thing is every day it's different yeah sure so and literally i've gone weeks on in going to the same place on the east end of sanibel island and every day it's a different place yeah it's like wow where did those come from those weren't well, here yeah. last night or or you know it just even changes. the even the actually the topography is even completely different i totally. mean it's, it, it, with it, as far as the storm the storm we just had a mild storm but i bet if you went out to the beach the beach is going to look slightly different totally different yeah. yeah uh and the other interesting one is even we don't appreciate it very much but it's the cycle of the moon there are times on the east end of sanibel when you see tons of seagrass on the beach in the rack line well, we don't have seagrass really in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. It's coming out of San Carlos Bay, and it's coming out of San Carlos Bay because we have giant full moons, so we have a lot of big tides. So even just lunar differences oh, um, are attributable to a lot of what we're seeing and how much is washed up on the beach. Yeah, that's fascinating. The uh, the moon would actually have an effect on on the type of. Uh things you're going to see in the ocean it really does it, it the moon affects the tides the tides are all about what gets washed up and and is deposited on the beach for you to see so it's not affecting really what's in the ocean but what's washed up on the shoreline for us to see so that literally every day is a new day out there so there's always an opportunity to stop in and learn something new that's incredible and uh how would everybody find out about um i mean 
numbers, email address? I mean, you know, how, how do the SanibelCschool.com is your URL, uh, is that right? Dot org. Sanibelc- oh, sorry. SanibelCschool.org. Sorry, sorry. Um, we are the number one ranked something on TripAdvisor. So TripAdvisor is a, a great way to find us. Facebook, um, you can Google Sanibel C School. And you can, it'll all go downhill from there. Um, and you have all your classes are on there? and uh, We do. All okay. the classes, all the offerings are on the website. Um, you can always call us. We have a number, uh, 472-8585, 239-472-8585. But probably the most easy thing, uh, particularly in this day and age, is to Google Sanibel Sea School. Perfect. And then the the uh, tell us about the... Um, uh, the, the one fundraiser you, you have, how would, if somebody wanted to get involved and, uh, and, and donate or get involved with uh, funding or how would they, what, what's the, the main event that you run? We run this one fundraiser a year and it's always the Saturday before Easter. Not 12 hours before Easter, but one week and one day before Easter. It's a giant tent on the causeway on the closest island to Fort Myers. Uh, and it has its own website, but the best way to do that would be go through sanibelcschool.org and search Octifest inside our... So the name of it is The name Octifest. is Octifest, Octifest, like an octopus, okay. but a festival for an octopus. Okay. Octifest. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, and uh, it is the single source of our scholarship funds that really allow us to carry out this institution throughout the year. So yeah. it's very important to us. We love to have volunteers. That's where we get a lot of volunteerism. It's a fantastic party. We have a wonderful cocktail party. We watch the sunset. Then we have a great dinner uh, that's catered on linen tablecloths and nice glasses and sit and watch the sunset and have a nice dinner. Beautiful, so beautiful, join beautiful. us. Yeah. Okay, so Bruce, I know you're all about the Sanibel Sea School, right, rightly so, but um, if you had something <laughs> other to do on Sanibel and you were visiting here, what would you recommend? What's your favorite things to do on Sanibel apart from the Sanibel Sea School? Um, I'm a paddler. I enjoy stand-up paddleboarding. Uh, Sanibel uh, and Southwest Florida in general has fantastic environment for stand-up paddleboarding. Um, there are always places that we can get out of the weather in the mangroves and do stuff. Uh, I also am a pretty avid fly fisherman, and I think fly fishing is fantastic. Um, Both things I've wanted to try, and actually I think we're definitely going to try stand-up paddleboarding just because I've, we've always talked about it. We have canoes at our house. Um, but uh, we're not sure about the uh, benefits to stand up paddleboarding. But now you've explained the differences, I think it might be a good oh, fun it, way of getting out. And I, even though I, I enjoy sort of exploration stand up paddleboarding, I, I do it as a, a sport, I do it as exercise. And it is one of the best forms of exercise for your core. And, and one of the things people, and w- if you want to learn to stand up paddleboard, you can come to Santa Bell Sea School and we'll we teach should. you how to we do should. that. We should. I think we'll make that for sure. Um, uh, we tend to think that we're using our arms, but we're really not using our arms to paddle to paddle anything. We're using our core cool. muscles. Yeah. Uh, and we spend a fair amount of time showing people, and I can't do it r- right now, but when we stroke a paddle, our arms never move. Our arms are totally fixed in place and we're moving our our larger, bigger muscles in our body and we're really just using our arms to hold the paddle stable. And so from that perspective, it's a fantastic core workout. It's um, stand-up paddleboarding in particular is really nice because it's it's elegant. It For people, kayaks are heavy. Mm-hmm. They're much lighter than kayaks. You can get them in and out. They're easier to transport. Uh, inflatable stand-up paddle boards are very common these days. They fit in a suitcase. You can put them on a plane. You can put them in the trunk. Ten minutes later, you can be out paddling. Um, the Causeway Islands typically are very good places to stand up paddle board so it's Your easy access. one way or the other, right? Exactly. From the wind, yep. you can get and one side of the island. Quick yeah. access to an automobile on and off. Um, uh, and yeah, I th- if I when I have spare time and I don't have a whole lot of spare time, it's either fly fishing or stand up paddle boarding, or the very best of all combinations, fly fishing from a stand up <laughs> paddle board. Okay, uh, which is uh, Dan yeah. James. He does the 
the fishing from paddle boards. So I think right. we did a front cover of the Chamber magazine, which is running now. Um, oh, cool. If you see it, it's actually uh, Dan James, a local rod maker, uh-huh. uh, and he's fishing from a paddle board. Yeah, yeah. no, it's fantastic. I'll put it up on uh, North Cap Tiba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. actually, another thing I've, I've always we toyed about trying was the fly fishing, which I yeah. didn't even know until what's the gentleman's name that opened the shop on Norm Ziegler. Norm Ziegler. Yep. Yeah, he opened the shop, and I was like, he's right. in the wrong place. He's got yeah, fly, exactly. fly fishing in the ocean. I didn't know you could do it. You know? No, and uh, during the summertime, it's a very well guarded secret. This is a fantastic fantastic place to fly fish really um, yeah it's fantastic it's it's snook fishing from the beach and this kind of fly fishing is really we tend to think fishing is i'm gonna bait a hook and throw it into the water and hope for the best yeah but this is looking for a fish visually in the water and then casting a fly to that fish really so it's literally hunting Right. So you're walking down the beach and you don't ever put a, a hook in the water until you see the fish that you're casting to and then you try to entice that fish to bite that hook. Wow. So, so totally even cool. if the water's a little murky, you're looking for ripples or you're looking for... Uh, well, during the summertime, the water's usually not very murky. No, that's true. Um, but, and particularly off the beaches, it's usually crystal clear. Yeah. Uh, the greater challenge typically is the fish can see you up on the beach. Uh. Um, but... Uh, it's called reading the water and you get very good at reading the water at understanding what the water behaves like when a fish is swimming under it gotcha so yeah there are little ripples we need to get norm on here we need to get yeah you should get norm yeah Uh, for sure yeah he's a great guy yeah Yeah, he's written books about fly fishing he has yeah yeah. he's a very good fly fisherman I spoke to him briefly we stopped in his shop just to talk and have a chat he seems like a really nice guy okay so we do have a little tradition on this podcast that not many people know about because I'm not sure if they make it all the way to the end but there is something here that Uh we get all guests to try sweet you know what that is I know what that is of course you're an island guy at heart and uh, alright let's see if we can get a note out of it what is it it's a a queen conch shell (laughs) here we go okay ready <laughs> These don't occur on Sanibel. No, yes. I've been told that. But yeah. anyway, is there one that does that you can actually? You could probably blow a horse conch. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We'll have to we'll have to look into that because it's and not. Both of these were eaten, by the way. Oh, they That's were. That putty is across here. The way you extract the animal out of that is called knocking a conch, and you take a screwdriver and chisel out that little hole. Oh, okay. The, the is the patched in hole there. The patched yeah. in hole is oh, where okay. it's cleaned. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. No. Yeah, there we go so I'm learning something even there about the Queen Kong Queen Kong Bruce it's been fascinating thank you, thank you very much Fantastic. and I'll, we'll do this again sometime but thanks for your to time I do appreciate it I'll go anytime we can blow a conch yeah <laughs> alright till next time thanks for listening to the Insider's Guide to the Islands please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes